Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'd like to welcome Clark Morgan here this evening. Who He's going to share some of his insights from research that he's doing at uh, James Liao's lab here at the Whitney Laboratory. As you may know, the Whitney Laboratory is made up of 10 faculty laboratories with graduate students and researchers working on significant problems, um, in, both in um, in the laboratory and in the field. And so this is one of our examples of field research that we do that we're gonna share with you tonight. Um, Clark actually um, got his bachelor's of science at Florida State University. And we do not hold that against him at the University of Florida because we want the best and the brightest here. Um, he received his master's of science degree from the University of North Florida where he studied coastal shark habitats. He joined the Whitney Laboratory in 2019 and has been leading this project and really getting it um, fully started here at the lab and in the Matanzas Basin. So I'm gonna turn it over to Clark. Um, and while he's getting set up, just wanna remind you that next month, um, March 11th, we will be having Dr. Elaine Siever join us to talk about development and her work and research here at the lab. Thank you and turning it over to Clark. All right, looks, can you hear me okay and, and see me okay so far? Yes, we can. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Thank you everybody else for being here tonight. Good evening. My name is Clark Morgan and I'm excited to talk to you tonight on our efforts trying to unlock the secrets of migration via real-time tracking of large marine animals for conservation. I am the lab manager of Dr. Jimmy Liao's lab at the Whitney Laboratory and um, I would like to preface this talk by saying in science and particularly in ecology, we essentially, when we answer one question, we then think of 10 more to ask. And that is gonna be the premise of this talk by the end of it, as we start to learn things, we just continue to ask questions and continue to pursue knowledge. So an overview of tonight's talk, I will introduce myself a little bit more. I'll talk about this discipline of movement ecology I'll introduce the technology of acoustic telemetry, our study species, the red drum, and our habitat here on the first coast. We'll talk about the methods we're conducting this research under, some of our preliminary results thus far, and the conclusions we can make from those results, and the future directions we're looking to take this work. So as Jessica mentioned, I received my undergraduate degree from Florida State in 2014. I then re I received my master's degree from UNF in Jacksonville in 2018. At UNF, I was working on uh, shark habitat use uh, on the first coast, and my thesis was based off of resource use and the reproductive ecology of sharks in the area. And here's a photo of me performing an ultrasound on a large female tiger shark, trying to determine if she's pregnant or not so that we can better understand her migration patterns as they relate to her reproductive cycle. At Whitney, I was, was hired in 2019 in June of 2019, excuse me, was working on a research tech on this project and then was promoted to lab manager last semester and have continued to grow this project and other aspects of it that I'll tell you about today. So the objectives of our lab, again, follow, excuse me, of this project in our lab, follow under the discipline of movement ecology. Movement ecology is essentially studying how an individual or population change their location through time and space. So movements are driven by processes that act across multiple spatial and temporal scales. If we think about biodiversity, what animals are there and how many of them are there? Movement ecology is where are the animals? Why are they there? And when are they there? What is important that makes them come and go? What kind of suitable habitat are they looking for? How are habitats connected? And in researching movement ecology, we are trying to understand how these animals are responding to dynamic environmental conditions. Um, storms, normal events, seasonal changes, tidal changes, temperature changes, etc., as well as bait and other animals moving around. The goal of studying movement ecology under this um, theme is we're trying to reveal important migration and breeding habitats for conservation, particularly here on the first coast. Uh, the first coast uh, is an area of the state and of the region, what I like to call the climate corridor. We transition from temperate mangroves around the Whitney lab that move um, more, excuse me, tropical mangroves around the Whitney lab that then as you move further north to Jacksonville, turn into a temperate marsh. This is a really excellent area to ask questions on animal movement. 
And this falls under a broader US, UF initiative called ICOST, which is a multidisciplinary effort of engineers, biologists, and sociologists tasked with monitoring coastal dynamics of infrastructure and physical processes. And essentially we're trying to use our red drum and other fish species as canaries in the coal mine, trying to use them as indicators to what's uh, happening in the water and around the area. So to begin uh, introducing passive acoustic telemetry, here in the top right are receivers. They're about the size of large one liter water bottles. And in the bottom left are transmitters. Transmitters range in size and the size is indicative of performance. The, the larger the tag, the larger the battery, the larger the animal you can put it in and the larger it will transmit within that battery. These communicate via sound underwater and at a certain program frequency of 69 kilohertz for what we're using. Essentially, this is uh, like an e-pass transponder as you drive through a toll booth, such that when a uh, transmitter comes within a certain distance of a receiver, the receiver records an event with a timestamp that can go later be downloaded. So passive acoustic telemetry, there's a lot of heavy lifting up front, a lot of field work in, the, in design and strategy in the beginning, deploying the, these receivers, um, strateg strategizing locations for where you're gonna put these receivers, based off of the questions you're going to ask that which are often long-term, have to design a deployment system that will work in the area you're deploying these, range test them so you have confidence that when an animal swims by, it will be picked up by the receiver. For our system, it's about uh, three to 500 meters, depending on the boat traffic and the tide, which is a, a fairly large range. And I'll show you how we've strategized these locations on a map in a little bit. And then the, the last key to a passive acoustic telemetry is that collaboration is key. And uh, again, a map will help make more sense of that, but essentially these, if a fish swims past one of our receivers, that's great, but it also, the technology works where if other people have these receivers underwater, they can still listen and detect our fish and then share the data with us later, which um, essentially expands our geographic range of our study immensely and is one of the biggest powers of this research method. We then go download these receivers uh, with the computer uh, in a Bluetooth key, as you can see in this bottom right-hand corner. And it's a little muddy, it's been cleaned. I wanna show you guys, one of our challenges is combating uh, biofouling, the growth of these little ecosystems that establish themselves on these aluminum poles and the receivers themselves. Now this is after several months in the water, it changes based off of the season, it changes where in the river or inlet they are, some barnacles or algae. Um, it, but however, we use a nylon sheath or a pantyhose to protect the receiver, we let the aluminum pole take all the growth it can handle, and then we protect the sensitive listening parts of our receiver. And this uh, makes for a really quick cleanup and is very good at protecting the receiver itself. And we're trying to get more of our colleagues um, using this technique right here. And we normally last about two to three months in the ocean before we change these receivers and download the data. To introduce Red Drum, Many of you guys are familiar with this fish in the area as anglers. I'm an angler myself. I'm uh, con concerned about conservation and excited to be working on it. But generally, for those who don't know, red drum larvae uh, are spawned in estuaries and then settle inshore. And the inshore mangroves, marsh, and oyster reefs are the nurseries for juvenile red drum. And then they move offshore as breeding adults. They occur from the Gulf of Mexico to the Chesapeake Bay feed on uh, crustaceans and fish throughout their life. And they have high uh, economical value from a commercial and recreational scale, but also a high ecological value when they become large animals like this. Locally in Northeastern Florida, the slot limit for legal harvest of a red drum. If you were to catch a red drum and you want to take it home to eat it, it would have to be within 18 to 27 inches of total length. Now, the reason for um, stopping the limit at 27 inches is essentially the slots are designed to protect breeding females and breeding adults in general. So essentially fish that are larger than 27 inches, they are contributing immensely to the uh, reproductive population, to the stock in the region. So we wanna, um, we're interested in conservation. So we wanna study the, the animals most important for reproduction. And the second part of targeting animals that are um, over the slot limit so that they're illegal to harvest if someone catches it, they have to put it in the water, is because we're, these tags cost uh, around $400 a piece. And so it's an expensive piece of equipment and we um, are trying to hedge our bets for poaching efforts there. To talk about uh, the 
collaboration of acoustic telemetry, here's a map of the Eastern seaboard of North America. And essentially all of these dots of different colors represent different acoustic arrays from different research organizations. So you can see that from the Caribbean to Canada, there are a plethora of receivers deployed underwater listening for animals. This is what I mean when if our fish swims out of St. Augustine, if he does go to Canada or the Caribbean, eventually if these uh, collaborative networks report it back to us, we will know where our animal went. Now, the main three organizations that we interact with are the FACT Network, Ocean Tracking Network, and the Animal Telemetry Network. FACT Network is based out of Florida. The Ocean Tracking Network is based out of Canada, and we have received 10 receivers on loan from them, so we work closely with both of these groups. When we zoom in to the gaps on the map in St. Augustine, we can see our array starts um, north in the Guano Tolomato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserve, the GTM NUR, here in um, around Ponte Vedra, and goes south 33 miles to Palm Coast, south of the Whitney Lab. Now, I mentioned earlier that this is kind of the, our first coast climate corridor. Through this expanse is where northern migration of um, mangroves has already been documented. And so this gives us, a as a result of um, climate change. And so we're, this is an interesting a geographic arena to be researching how animals are moving through it and using it. Our, our collaborators are also very excited because the next closest arrays are near Kennedy Space Center to the south and near the Georgia Florida border to the north. And so we're about 50 miles separate from these other uh, researchers. We'll zoom in on our maps here a little bit. And now we're looking around St. Augustine and this will give you an idea of the strategy in designing our deployment system that I mentioned earlier. We could see that we basically have created gates so that if an animal swims in or out this inlet to or from the ocean, we should, and it has a tag in it, we should hear from it, we should detect it. And that's what we wanna know. We wanna know generally how animals are moving in and out of our inshore system, trying to understand how the habitats are connected through the inlet. And then you can see these pinch points of receivers located inside the river here around uh, Volano Beach, the Volano Bridge, and towards the Tolomata River, we have several receivers. These are pinch points. So now we know how the animal is moving through the system. The same can be said through the south, through uh, St. Augustine and around the Bridge of Lions and further downtown. When we look to the south, uh, this is just the, the second half of that map, just moving down the coast a little bit. Whitney Labs here in the middle around Marineland or Palm Coast receiver south of Whitney that leads to Daytona 50 miles to the south. We have the Matanzas Inlet covered here with receivers as well. So again, we're blocking the entry and exits to the systems, trying to understand how animals are moving in and out of our systems, while also having some through Crescent Beach. And also these blue dots are water quality stations. So this is our advantage of trying to understand how environmental parameters are impacting movement of the fish. The uh, power of our collaboration is uh, FWC locally. I cannot say enough about this group of receivers, there are 15 receivers off the coast of St. Augustine, spanning up to 30 miles that are accessed by scuba divers from the state uh, law enforcement and, and research agency. And they do uh, diving on these a few times a year. These have provided us with invaluable data on our fish movement. And I'll show you a little bit more about these in a bit. But essentially, um, you know, in order to track the fish, we first must find the fish to tag them to then find out where they go. We spent a lot of time in the St. Augustine Inlet uh, since July, 2019. We've had two field seasons so far, fishing for these oversized red drum uh, with heavy tackle and large bait. And when we catch them, as we've been lucky enough to do a few times now, we bring them on board and we put, flip them over and secure them. They kind of calm down when you flip them upside down. We put uh, a pump in their mouth with fresh water, with fresh salt water going over them and they're able to breathe while we insert an acoustic tag into their gut cavity, then surgically stitch it back up. And this takes about eight to 10 minutes. This is all within university animal safety and handling protocols and is designed to minimize the stress on the fish. While we have the animal on board, we're taking as many samples as we can to maximize our effort, but also maximizes the fish's time. So we're taking a muscle sample, a blood sample and a spine sample these are useful for understanding its diet, understanding uh, any toxic effects like mercury, its age. And then you can see this yellow string uh, dart tag here, spaghetti tag. 
This alerts anglers if they catch it, that they should report it and return it to the water, please, because it is a research animal. Uh, a second fishing effort and um, more of a citizen science effort is our Captain of Conservation Angler Outreach Program. We have distributed a separate series of red external dart tags to a handful of local captains who are um, very interested in the state of the fishery and conservation and, and work closely with us in not only finding fish, but also um, just supporting our program. And so in this, we're able to increase the size of the animals that we're sampling because we're not doing surgery on these. These are a quick, a quick insert. So the captains can do it. We can do it on a small fish that's 10 inches or a large fish. So it gives us a broader, and these guys are on the water every day. So it gives us a broader geographic sampling range and a broader size range of the species that we're uh, studying. And so if somebody recaptures it, we can draw a line between those points and find some pretty basic but interesting information. So thus far, we have tagged 39 fish in those two field seasons. Uh, the majority of those fish have been over 27 inches. There's a couple that uh, were just under the slot as we're getting a little curious there. Um, almost 7,000 individual detection events from our 39 fish. And uh, there's another 1,800 detections of other animals. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. At least 20 of our fish have uh, been detected with movement patterns suggesting that they have survived. We expect this number to be much higher um, and because our, we, of our methods and our strong release of the fish as seen in this photo. Um, however, the data suggests more than half of our fish have survived thus far. It's a long, a long game we're playing here and when we may hear from these animals. And two of our fish have been recreationally recaptured, one within a week, which is a great sign that this animal is doing its thing as a fish quickly after meeting us for a quick surgery. So, uh, without getting overwhelmed, I want to quickly explain this graph to you guys. It's just two squiggly lines. Um, the orange line is salinity. The red line is temperature. The x-axis is time. This basically is a general environmental condition um, graph of the of St. Augustine. So on the on the x-axis, started in July 2019. It ends at the end of August 2020. When we look at salinity, we can see that it fluctuates between 30 and 35. This is pretty typical in a marine environment. There'll be some storms, some tidal events, some rain events that will drop it um, every, on a daily basis. But as you can see, it's sustained. It stays normally above 30. Temperature, however, on the other hand, is the more interesting parameter for our study and for this graph. Now, the snowbirds in the audience may disagree, but we have a, an actual seasonal winter in northeastern Florida. And we can see that in November, the temperatures that would hang around 20, no, 30, 25 or 30 degrees Celsius then dip below uh, 20 to around 15 degrees for the winter time for three or four months before warming up again in the springtime. Again, this is just to paint the picture of the general seasonality here as it kind of is of interest for the patterns that we're seeing. So to show you what some of this data looks like, we'll look at our main uh, central St. Augustine Inlet receiver. This one's in the deep water in the middle. So this is one we're most confident that if anything enters our system, we'll hear from it. This is called an abacus plot. And this is a one way to visualize the data. Essentially, we have time on the bottom uh, from February to August of 2020. Each of these dots uh, of each color is a unique tag, which is assigned to a unique animal. And if a dot is present, that means the animal was detected on this receiver. If there's gaps in the data, that means this animal was absent from the receiver. We can only say things about the animals we hear from. And so again, this is just general presence absence under the um, uh, looking at time on the calendar, but then also remembering temperature that we saw. So when we assign animals to this, we can see that here are four of our red drum that are present starting in February. Uh, some of them show up later in the summer. This is again, just showing you how we're identifying animals to these, uh, this graphical representation. We then see four lemon sharks uh, in our array coming through the middle. Three, uh, two of them came through in the early winter in uh, February and March. This is an interesting migration for this species as they came from the Kennedy Space Center to the south. So again, this climate corridor, this is un interesting to understand when these animals are overwintering. We then have two large uh, lemon sharks from South Florida like Jupiter Boca Raton that seem to be seasonal residents for the summer in St. Augustine. This winter, we had a nine foot mature sand tiger shark come down from North Carolina, which is an interesting range expansion of that moving south. 
We've also had black tips come down from Boca Raton as well, who are popping into the inlet. So this is showing the collaborative effort that our study is complementing other researchers who have tags out. And we hope that our animals are doing the same on their receivers. But then collaboration is key, but also a double-edged sword. There's at least four animals we're waiting for other people to update in the system to tell us the unique species and, I, and basically the length and size of these animals that have appeared. So this is part of the waiting game. Tell a couple quick stories about some animal movement. Uh, underneath the Volano Bridge, we tagged a 37 inch fish in November. You can see me in the right photo, double checking I've got the tag ID right before I release the animal. When we look at these two receivers here, this gate between Volano Bridge, I'll show you the similar pot again that you have seen where we see presence absence. So when we first tagged this fish in November, 2019, down here on the bottom left, we can see that between these two receivers, this animal was detected almost every day until July the next year. So through the winter, through the spring and in the summer. And when we look at the temperature and salinity data, again, more importantly, the temperature data, we can see that this animal sustained seasonally cold temperatures into uh, the 50s and 60s and stayed put living around the bridge. And then uh, as things warmed up, it may have moved on. It may be somewhere else in the array. The data may be out there for us. But what we can see here is that this animal, a very large animal that it, um, under some assumptions would be living offshore is actually living inshore, which is very interesting locally. I'll tell a few off -store tracks, offshore tracks right now. One of our first fish, number two, that was 32 inches long, well over the slot, was tagged in um, July, 2019. Six weeks later, it started to move offshore and we see it moving into deeper water. And I remember that these are FWC's receivers. And on, on one day, we were able to track it move about uh, five miles. And from that time on September the 11th, we we're able to um, extrapolate a, a rough swimming speed of around three meters per second. Now this gives us um, an idea and a metric that we can then use in our laboratory experiments to understand fish swimming performance and physiology. This animal then hung around offshore, made its way further offshore about 15 miles by the end of January. We didn't hear anything from it for about six months. And then a year and two days later, it returned to the exact same spot. So this gives us an idea of uh, movements on an annual scale. And we're excited to see what this animal will tell us in another year's time. That animal was also uh, overlapped within uh, five minutes. It spent five minutes on the same receiver with another similar size tagged fish. We know this species schools. This data is indicative of schooling behavior of our tagged red drum. Again, we have these ideas from what our natural observations are, but here we are able to put the data behind them. Uh, a another story of interest is in late October, a very large 42 inch fish was tagged near the inlet. It only went about four miles offshore for two months before hanging around the inlet for another two months. So this animal didn't move 30 miles, 20 miles offshore. This animal just hung out a a few miles off and came back. And interestingly enough, it then moved inshore north. And we don't know where this animal could have gone next. Again, it's just, we ask more questions once we get more answers. And so we're wondering if this animal has been um, unnaturally connected to the St. John's River because this intercoastal system leads to the St. John's River from dredging through Palm Valley and Jacksonville Beach. That, always, that wasn't always there. So interesting to understand that in terms of human impact on migration. And we had a fish tagged from that same July, move 85 miles up into Georgia and live up in Georgia for at least six months. So now we have animals crossing state boundaries. This is the power of our collaborative networks. We don't have receivers up there. This data was sent back to us, but makes us wonder about habitat connectivity and the local population of Red Drum in St. Augustine, if they're moving to Georgia and staying up there or coming back or not. And so starting to put these pieces of the puzzle together and these uh, animals are managed as a single stock in the region. So they are of the same population, but locally we're concerned about the population locally. And so this is of, of high interest to us and our collaborators uh, in Georgia. And then our, our most recent data is uh, in late October of this past year, just a few months ago, we had a heavy effort where we tagged eight large fish off the St. Augustine Pier uh, on St. Augustine Beach uh, in late, late October, as you can see there. And when we downloaded our receivers a month later, 
we found that five of those eight fish moved in shore after we tagged them. Three of them went south and hung out uh, around downtown St. Augustine, the 312 bridge. We don't know if they're still there. It'd be really interesting to know if we um, track them moving in. And then we had two more go north. Again, a different, a different direction and a different question. However, what's very exciting about this is this makes us wonder if this movement is after a spawning event, given the time of year and the tide and the moon cycle. So this is some of the analysis we have yet to do. But one of our hypotheses is that this could have been after a spawn offshore in the inlet, these animals then move inshore to overwinter. So from these FWC receivers, we've um, six of our animals have been detected uh, around 900 times. However, this, these receivers have picked up uh, 150 different animals of 19 different species. And this is the majority of them here. This array out here is really of interest for cobia as they migrate from Virginia and the Carolinas down to Florida. However, we have several highly migratory large shark species, black tip sandbars, that are utilizing uh, the same array and um, same habitat, excuse me. And also uh, large sharks like tiger sharks and great whites, which we have hypotheses that these animals may be feeding on our red drum. So a very dynamic and a very productive ecosystem um, offshore and inshore of St. Augustine, which is how we wanna keep it. And so that's why this research is uh, important to understand how we, all these animals are interacting with each other and with the environmental conditions. So back to our large map, we have a lot of data. The fish are working for us as they move now. Uh, we're on the passive part of this game. And so now we're relying on our collaborators and our technology and time in order to answer the other questions about the other 19 fish and where the other animals have gone and where they may show up next. So we know to conclude preliminary from our data that our red drum have varying patterns of local movement and activity. Uh, some of them overwinter inshore and seem to be residential. Others overwinter offshore. Some go back and forth. There is clearly offshore connectivity with potential schooling documented, which also has spawning implications. And the capture location may matter. So we're curious to see how these things change um, with time as, as the data continue to grow. And again, patience is key for the data itself, for the batteries of these animals and on our collaborators to download the data. But we know that our acoustic array and in this first coast climate corridor um, is very important for seasonal migrations of highly migratory species. We have seasonal residency detected highly migratory species, which suggests that these animals coming from South Florida, they may stop moving north once they get to St. Augustine. And then of course, several mysteries yet to be solved. We're just getting going and hoping to continue building on this work by improving our understanding of high resolution behaviors in the wild through multiple different technologies. We are act actively tracking fish to understand how they move on a daily basis by following behind them with a hydrophone. We are conducting respirometry experiments in the flow tank to understand their metabolism at different uh, swimming performances. We're developing biologgers and accelerometers to attach to these animals so that we can look at their activity on a more fine scale. And we're also working with Dr. Leonardo Abayar Castro on creating an aquaculture collaboration for conservation in raising red drum for release into the wild at Whitney. While we're also considering other species of interest, possibly bait fish, other uh, predatory fish like triple tail snook or jacks, possibly some sharks. So we've, we're, again, we're kind of ironing out the, the foundation for this work to continue building upon itself. I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, John Perkner, who has been instrumental since I began working at Whitney and getting this project kind of through the brainstorming and early construction phases with range testing the receivers, developing the deployment system, uh, fishing equipment, effort, and time. And um, really appreciate everything John, John has done for us. We've also worked very closely with Peter Myers, um, particularly in this fall. I have spent a lot of time with Pete uh, brainstorming and working hard to capture more fish, tag more fish, looking at remote sensing development, experimental camera systems, and I uh, really appreciate your time and effort as well, Pete. It takes a village at Whitney, uh, nationally, locally, internationally, with a lot of corporate sponsors. Um, we're thankful to everybody who's involved with this, all of our captains for conservation and the other uh, people at Whitney who keep the, keep the lights on and keep the boats running for us and keep our, uh, and all of our corporate sponsors keeping our gear supplied as well and our other conservation initiatives. So with that, I thank you guys. Uh, we'll open up for, 
Q and A session here in a minute. Um, after you guys, hopefully, ace your quiz. Thanks for listening. No cheating on the quiz. Hi there. So as Clark said, um, we have our Q&A going. I'm sorry I didn't mention enough about it earlier. So if you have questions, you can type it into the Q&A button below. And I'll be asking Clark some of these questions. Um, hopefully you have a chance to do our, our last question for you while we get ready for our Q&A. I see there's lots of um, good questions coming up. So we'll get started on those. And um, if you have questions, you can write them in the Q&A and uh, I'll be monitoring those as we talk through. So our first question, first of all, I wanna thank Clark for spending some time with us this evening, sharing about uh, the program. Um, as he mentioned, there's significant corporate um, sponsorship of this and also private foundational support to get this program going as part of our ICOS effort. Um, so one of the questions is, how do we recover the transmitters? Are they considered disposable over time? If so, is there a risk to the surrounding environment with the transmitters left on the ocean floor? Great question. Uh, definitely concerned with uh, transmitters. We're definitely concerned about the animals in the environment. The, the animals are, excuse me, the transmitters are surgically implanted inside the animals. And so they are, the animals are sutured, sutured shut. And essentially that tag is then permanent within the gut cavity of the animal. Uh, if you reflect back to the image I showed of the different sizes of the tags, uh, they're still relatively small. It's half the size of a uh, half a chapstick tube. But basically there's a rule that the tag must be less than 2% of the to animal's total mass. And that's the rule that we follow. But these big fish, that's not a problem at all. But essentially it just becomes, um, it, it has, the battery dies and it remains within the animal until the animal then perishes. Um, what do you think about the receivers? Because it sounds like they might also have a question about that. Do we pull our receivers out when we're done? What's our protocol? Got that? you. So the receivers are um, very well made and designed to not degrade in the water um, under extreme pressure or heat or environmental conditions. Our receivers are very shallow. They're uh, from eight to 20 feet. Um, some people drop these things to the bottom of the ocean to a thousand feet or 5,000 feet. So they're well built to, to not break under pressure. We, we pull ours out of the water um, every few months to download them, but otherwise the longer they're in the water, the better, because you never know what animals could be swimming around. And that's what we've shown through this work is we have tagged red drum in the area. However, there's plenty of other animals swimming around with tags in them where we can detect them and provide valuable information. So this leads to a question about what happens when a shark eats a monitored red drum? Do we then trace the shark? Great question. Um, there are tags that are designed to do that. However, ours are not. And what I, so if our red drum was eaten by a shark, our tag would then be passed through the, the shark as waste th through its normal digestion. And it would fall to the ocean floor and become obsolete. If it fell within range of a receiver, we I have uh, there are statistical analyses that you can do to determine if that was on if it was in a fish or not. Basically, to eliminate false detections. The other part of that is um, predator and prey interactions are an important part of this work, and so there are some tags that we could put in, say, a mullet, a small mullet, a bait fish of a mullet that's eight inches long. And we would put a tag in there that if it was eaten by a red drum, the tag would then change frequency based off of the stomach acid inside the fish. And so then we would know that that animal had been consumed and was a prey and, and then provides that kind of information that you're thinking of. So great question. Um, so we have a question about the data and how it works with these networks. Um, do we download it all into a single database or do we have to rely on someone downloading from their receiver and informing you that one of your fish were captured on it? So another great question. There is, we do have to rely on other people. 
We, uh, part of these networks, particularly the fact network and the ocean tracking network, there are ethical, moral, and some, some sort of legal binding obligations where you have to, um, you have to report your, the data that you download. Now you report this to um, an online portal, it's called a node. And essentially you do this twice a year, you're required to do it twice a year. And that information is then synthesized by the organizers of the node and sent out periodically to you so that um, the technology and the data analysis itself is translational between institutions. Okay. Um, here's a question from Devlin. Do you see any colorations with red drums migrating in line with extreme weather approaching? Oh, interesting. Well, great question, Devlin. Um, thankfully, since we've been doing this work, we haven't had any real extreme weather yet um, on, the, on the Florida scale, at least. And so that's the importance of getting this work out ahead of time and establishing the baseline so that we would expect to see some movements. Um, we would, what we'd expect to see is with extreme weather, particularly like a, a large hurricane, what we've seen in other fish species is that these animals actually can sense the pressure change coming and they move further offshore where the, the environmental parameters are more stable and they're less susceptible to being a uh, turbulent environment from the wind and water. So um, there's a question about other species. Are other species being studied this way like spotted sea trout? Yes, they are uh, spotted sea, except not in St. Augustine at the moment. Um, spotted sea trout, they're much more concerned with spotted sea trout in um, Indian River Lagoon, Kennedy Space Center area, I uh, mentioned some of their work coming through, and also further south um, around Jupiter to Cuesta area, and that work is carried out by FWC itself, the state itself. But yes, and sea trout are of interest to us as well. They are in the same family as red drum, and they are um, also a very important coastal fish. Okay. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to say like <laughs> we're going to try to get through them. But um, if your question doesn't get answered tonight, um, I'm going to put our email, uh, our general email in the chat, too. So we we're happy to talk more um, just in case we don't get to to all of them. Um, if you write in after this point. Um, so uh, someone has a question about really understanding how do the receivers work with picking up sound? Does that mean there's actual sounds being emitted? So there, the, the transmitter, the tag itself is the sound that the receiver is listening for. That, that's, so this is an acoustic receiver um, designed to communicate with these transmitters. There are hydrophones that you could put underwater and you could hear boat noises and oyster toadfish cracking and, and lobsters making noises and things like that. That is not this technology. We are using on a specific program frequency of 69 kilohertz. And that's what, what the receiver is listening for. Now that, but if, there, if a boat does swim over, excuse me, if a boat does drive over the receiver while fish is moving past, there does become noise interference just because it's a loud, noisy environment. The receiver is not listening to the boat. It's just that the sound waves are interfering with each other. That makes me ask. So is this something we could hear or is it something? We, the tags that we have ourselves, we cannot hear. The next, okay larger size, sometimes you can, if it's really quiet, you can kind of hear them start to go, but we cannot hear these. So here's a question about red drum. What is the greatest threat to the red drum? Why are we concerned? I think we had another question that ties into that of someone who joined late of why, why did we choose the red drum, which we kind of went into, but great. what is the greatest threat? Great, great question. Uh, people are the greatest threat to most animals. Um, animals, particularly fish in the marine environment. Um, they're threatened by overfishing. Uh, they're fishing by habitat, excuse me, threatened by habitat loss and overconsumption and um, pollution. And so th they, they are obviously as fish and as smaller fish subject to being prey to other animals. However, people are the biggest concern. Um, and that's why this, why we're excited about this work because we believe that if we can understand how these big fish are operating on a local level that it will have profound implications for the population in the region. And that's why the movements are so important to us, particularly because these animals are um, broadcast spawners. So their eggs 
their eggs and larva are dictated by oceanographic currents. And so even if they, some of them may recruit, excuse me, may breed in St. Augustine, but we don't know where their, their larva settle. And the same can be said, we don't know what larva is settling in St. Augustine. And so because of this kind of big picture regional ocean basin um, situation, we're particularly concerned about how they're interacting on a local level. Okay, great. Um, so we have a question about, um, a lot of questions about sample size, loss of fish, um, how we know, if we know we've tagged, um, if we've had fish loss after they've been tagged, there are some questions around that. How, how would um, you answer that about, do we know how many have survived after being tagged um, in the Great environment? Question. So um, in, in general, you can only say something about a fish that you've received a detection from. Just because we haven't heard from 19 of these animals yet, doesn't mean they've perished or they didn't survive the surgery. It means they could be in, it could mean that they are swimming in a region of the ocean that there are no receivers. Now it looks like a lot of the Eastern seaboard is covered in receivers, but things happen. And again, there's delays in data downloading. Um, we are confident, well, we've heard from 20 of our fish, we're confident with our methods that we've tested in the lab. And I mean, in the lab, we've um, done surgeries and then kept the fish in tanks to see how they respond, to see how the tag has been retained to ensure survivability. And so um, we're, we're very confident in the, the animals we're hearing from. But I would also like to say that this data is continuing to grow. And so we still have two years to hear from more of these animals and so we, it's where we are so far is great, but we could be better than that. And we may be better than that. We just haven't heard yet. Um, there was another part of that question, um, sample size. Yeah, we're, the, the more the better, obviously uh, it's expensive, but particularly for migration and tracking studies, um, sample size is important, but there, there's a lot of power to small sample sizes. For example, the first great white shark that swam from Australia to South Africa, that changed the game for international management and policy because it was crossing oceanic boundaries and political boundaries. And so while it would be great to have a to have 10, or excuse me, 100 different tagged red drum out there, the, we're very comfortable with the number we have and we're, we're excited about the data we're getting back. So um, has this study given us information on the red drum population yet based on our sample? Yes, it has. And, um, and again, this is it's given us more questions to ask about these red drum. So we, we, we know that some are staying here year round. We know some are staying in shore. We're challenging this idea that uh, large bull reds only live offshore or they only migrate when it's time to breed. And so it's constantly evolving. And again, it, it, um, the, the questions and answers continue to grow. But we, we do feel like we're getting a better hold on these animals. And, and again, also to the point of, I mentioned in the beginning of the tagging slide where in order to study these animals in the first place, you have to find them, to tag them, to then track them. And that took a, that took a lot of effort as well. And there were a lot of days striking out till we really figured out how these animals were moving. And so, um, yeah, the, but the, the knowledge is infinite. And that's, that's the beauty of this, the beauty and the pain of this game. Um, is there a method for repositioning the receivers after the first deployment if we find them, you know, different areas we want to study? Yes, great question. We're in the process of doing that right now. We're taking a receiver from an area that doesn't, hasn't produced a lot of data for us, and we're moving it uh, with the help of FWC to that barge um, off St. Augustine Beach and putting it um, in a more uh, st strategic, strategic location, and that's just an example of what we're learning as we go along as well. We're constantly having to evolve with the animals and, and uh, change our strategies to continue to produce sound science and data here. Great, um, Clark, do you need volunteers for this project? There's a couple people asking, some captains asking in the, the uh, oh, Q&A and how would they get in touch with us? That's great, um, via email. Uh, we can connect them through whatever email you're providing or they can reach out to me directly. Uh, we're definitely interested in volunteers um, in terms of effort on the water or even if there are captains that can deploy these dart tags. So 
Um, our community engagement is a huge part of our success here and a huge part of this importance um, as this is a huge, the red drum fishery is a huge fishery in St. Augustine. So we would, we would love to try to get involved with you guys. So I just put in the um, chat, it's WLMB at Whitney.ufl.edu. You can also just call our main number 461-4000. Um, and also we have a contact form on our website that's, it says get in touch and you can fill out that form. The fastest way is the, the Whitney email, which um, we actually monitor um, myself and, and my team. So we will make sure that gets to Clark and the scientists working on this. Um, there's a couple questions about the sound admitted from the transmitters and does, do those impact whales and other fish? That was um, one of the questions, I, I think related to the sound question that we had asked before um, with the tags. Great question. No, I, we do. The research suggests that they do not negatively impact or interact with the other animals via sound. And there are actually some technologies emerging now where they're creating ocean gliders. If you kind of think of it like a drone that is a moving receiver. And so this thing will move around the ocean basin, listening for fish constantly, where it's not a fixed station like I've shown us, but one that's mobile with the mobile fish. And that's and that's that's really exciting to hear them doing things like that. But no, there's there's no negative interactions. Um, I'm just going to answer one about signing up for updates on this study. If you want to send us an email, I'll put you on our contact list. Um, I did put the email in the chat. Um, here's a question um, from Eric. Do you know any effort researching flounder numbers locally? From local observation over a period of years, we are noticing a significant population de decline inshore. Yikes, sorry to hear that. Those are kind of, that's kind of the anecdotes that fueled some of the fire of this project. No, I specifically do not know of anyone doing similar work on flounder, but I would expect that FWC would be uh, constantly monitoring through their fisheries independent monitoring survey, which would provide the, the data on that. Um, but that, so I, I don't have anything specific on that, but that is also a species of interest and um, you provide again, more fuel for the fire for new species for us to study. Great. Um, what are some, and we're gonna wrap up questions here. I am trying to answer some of these. Um, just in the chat if I can, so that are more technical of how to get in touch with us. But we had, um, two, I'm covering two last questions. One is, what distance did the farthest fish travel? And then what are some tricky challenges you and your team have experienced and what solutions? And nice. so they said, when you mention one question leads to 10 more, got them thinking. Nice. Okay, uh, so the furthest distance that we know of so far is um, 85, around 85 miles to, to Georgia. That Again, that's the data that we have today. Uh, stay tuned to update it to this. If we have a fish that moves to North Carolina or to South Florida, that would, that would beat that distance. Um, but that's, the, that's our, our prize swimmer for crossing state boundaries so far. In terms of um, as answering one question and asking more things that we've learned. Well, we've evolved our, there's two parts to that. We've evolved our deployment system to make it um, much easier and accessible to get. We actually were snorkeling at first to deploy these receivers and um, wasn't too keen on that. So we moved to a dry deployment system, which made things much more efficient as we're running around trying to get these things at slack tide. But I think uh, the second part of that, of answering questions and then asking more, um, the Volano beach fish that I started off talking about, that was our first example of the, an animal doing something that we did not expect it to do. And then that changed our game of how we were thinking and where we wanted to target these fish. And that's why we were particularly excited when our fish that were tagged on the barge in October, three weeks later, then moved, it looked to seem to be hanging out under another bridge. And so, the bridge is an interesting part of the St. Augustine inshore area, and they may be helping hold populations of these fish, particularly in the winter. And if it's, it could be a positive benefit for the, 
for the fish, which is a nice way to think about human development and our local ecosystems. Thank you so much, Clark. I think this was Great. the most Q&A we've had. We had 24 questions. Love I did it. <laughs> I did try to answer some of them in the Q&A. And like I said, if you'd like to send something after, please feel free to write our WLMB email. It's WLMB at Whitney.ufl.edu. And we will get back to you with answers. Thank you so much for your time this evening, everyone. We hope to see you next time. Um, March 11th, we'll be having our next Sip in Science. I appreciate you all joining us. And thank you so much, Clark, for, for presenting your work to us tonight. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, thanks for letting me run over. Great talking to you all. <laughs>